Henry Ford is a name that conjures thoughts of the Model T and the first assembly lines. But did you also know he helped develop the suburbs? That topic explored on this edition of AutoLine This Week. Underwriting for AutoLine This Week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine This Week. You know, Everyone knows that Henry Ford put the world on wheels with the Model T and that that led to the development of suburbs as we know them today. But what most people don't know is that Henry Ford was actually very active in the development of suburbs. And we're going to be talking about that today because one of my guests is the author of a book called Henry Ford's Plan for the American Suburb. And that author is Heather Barrow. Heather, great to have you on the show today. Very nice to have me here. Thank you. Also joining us are John Beck. He is a professor at the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations at Michigan State University. And Matt Anderson is the automotive curator at the Henry Ford Museum. And great to have all of you here today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good deal. Heather, yeah, I wasn't aware that Henry Ford really pushed for the development of suburbs. What motivated him to do that? Well, uh, it wasn't the most unusual thing for a leader of industry uh, to be involved with the development of company towns. Someone that might come to mind would be George Pullman, for example. But what was unique about Henry Ford as an urban planner uh, who had his workers in mind in terms of their living conditions was that he wanted to create suburbs for them to live in. Uh, rather than a self-contained city, as many company towns had been. And he wanted to have the quality of life that goes with the suburbs, home ownership. Of course, he wanted them to be car owners as well. And he wanted them to have access to the better living conditions outside of the cities. You know, this was 100 years ago when cities were dirty, full of crime, pollution, crowded, lots of poverty and he wanted to give them that better way of life. Another difference between him and somebody like a Pullman was that he created a model community of Ford Homes, which is a subdivision located in Dearborn, Michigan. It's still there today, it's been preserved. He wanted this to be a prototype that would be copied by entrepreneurial subdividers. He wanted his plan to be implemented, but not through him directly. He just wanted to put the idea in place. He wanted to create an ideology about what was a better way of life for American workers. He wanted to create this prototype as his, the physical embodiment of his vision. But he also did put his money where his mouth was in the sense that he created a higher wage, a living wage, where workers themselves could afford to buy the houses after the private sub-developers had created them. Matt, at the Henry Ford Museum, of course, you have all kinds of cars, including a lot of Henry Ford's original uh, machinery. Is this something that you get into as well in the museum, uh, a topic that you cover is the development of the suburb? We, we do get asked about it a bit. And of course, Dearborn is part and parcel of the Henry Ford story. And his family had been there for a generation before he was born. And he um, had lived in Detroit for a few years, but then of course came back to Dearborn and built Fairlane and then built the museum there. So he's one of those fellows that certainly traveled the world, but never got very far from home in the long run. So absolutely, that does come up in uh, some of our research and some of our holdings in our archives there too. And Matt, I, or John, I gotta believe that uh, the development of the suburbs changed America from what it had been. Well, I think it, it changed it dramatically from the point of view that I think what Heather is really laying out is it, it gave people a new aspiration, a different kind of aspiration that is a kind of home ownership ultimately what you know that we believe very strongly uh, as the development of America was about sub suburbanization that people became uh, you know very distinct distinctly living in one place and working in another, which makes Dearborn very different at that time, just because the fact that the Rouge was in effect right right on the, virtually on the doorstep. The Rouge plant, the, yes. where, you know, the big manufacturing where complex. The, where many of these workers were, were uh, working was right there in Dearborn as well. Was Henry actively involved? I mean, did he just encourage it or was he active, actively involved in all of this? Well, he, he financed the, this, model subdivision called the Ford Homes. Um, and he was also, we have to assume 
that as the largest taxpayer of Dearborn, that he was in very tight with the city council. So if he expected a certain type of zoning to exist in that community, or for certain um, annexations to occur that helped the city eventually incorporate, that of course he may have had quite an influence behind the scenes, why wouldn't they accommodate not only the largest employer, the biggest taxpayer of their community, he's one of the richest men in the country, if not the world at the time. We can only assume that he had this backroom influence politically. Of course, as a historian, I can't say that those documents that prove it exist to this day, but we do know that he did things like write in letters to the editor of the local newspaper and that those were published and that he obviously supported in, in a few situations in a public way, this idea that Dearborn should become a large suburb. I think that it, it's fair to say that, that Ford, uh, as a person, was very interested in control and in a kind of an ideal worker. Um, he, through the Service Bureau, he had always uh, attempted to make sure that people were not necessarily drinking alcohol, were living uh, upright lives. He tried to dictate how they should live. And so, in some ways, the creation of a, a suburb is kind of antithetical, in a way, to what you might see as the problem of, of urbanization. That is, you know, kind of a runaway development, uh, maybe the easy access to a variety of things that Henry Ford didn't want them to have easy access to. Uh, and it, it's parallel to a lot of the other things that Ford was involved in, the development of the, the industrial village uh, plants across uh, southeastern Michigan, a belief that there was a, a certain way that one should live and a certain way that one should work, and that those two were married in relation to you know, what, what off-duty and on-duty life really was like. And I think Dearborn is simply another example of that same ideology of his. Matt, you work in Dearborn. Have you seen this neighborhood and looked at these homes? Yeah, the Ford homes are still there. They're a historic district now in Dearborn. I think there were about six different styles that they built of these houses, all priced somewhat on the high side. I think Ford was originally targeting uh, upper-level managers or even perhaps junior executives in some of them, but uh, very close walk to what at that time had been the Ford's and tractor plant and then became the Ford Engineering Lab, which was where Henry Ford maintained his office and really was the heart of the Ford Motor Company, even more so than the Rouge in terms of the uh, decisions being made. These houses, uh, Heather, you got a picture in your book, and yes. I, I think from like 1917, if, if I got it, they look really nice. I mean, from, from my eye, they, it looks like these were pretty good homes. Yes, you're right. I think that there is an aesthetic there that he's interested in, where he's really trying to portray the suburbs as being the new place for the American dream. He goes out of his way to make sure that these buildings have um, higher quality materials, better designs. Um, the main architect who's been attributed to, to, to the designing this is Leonard Willeke. He was an expert on company towns developed throughout the US as well as in England. And so when these company towns were built, um, th there was a benevolent intention there to create an example of just a better way of life, a higher quality of life. Now, realistically, as a prototype, were they replicated throughout Dearborn? No, because they weren't affordable. They were just the model of what a suburban house could look like. Um, they weren't literally implemented that way. They were implemented on a much smaller and more modest scale. John, uh, the move to the suburbs really changed American society, though, and not always for the better. Well, and, and let me let me uh, raise something that I found was was absolutely fascinating in uh, in Heather's book. That move to the suburbs, we often think of people living in one place and then working in the other. In the case of the Ford Rouge plant, many of the people who were working in the Rouge and were living somewhere else were African Americans and others in Detroit who spent hours getting to work one way uh, and then the other each day. So we often think of jobs being in the center city and people in effect moving out and then going back to the center. I think the, the Ford Rouge plant really changed dramatically uh, a number of things by being out here 
you know, in, in the Dearborn area where people could live close to it, but at the same time, it was a, it was a big hardship, I think, for a lot of people to actually get back and forth to, to work each day. And if you think of 100,000 people over a period of a 24-hour production moving in and out of that plant, both living close and also living far away, it is really an awesome kind of, uh, of uh, vision of what, uh, what working life would have looked like. One of my favorite points in the book, Heather, is about how Ford, even as the man who put the world in the automobile, was fully dependent on streetcar systems to move some of his workers to and from the plant and realized that, in fact, got involved in trying to improve the lines and extend the reach to the Rouge and beyond. Yes, he did. Yes, he, for a period of time, he was involved with trying to improve and expand um, the streetcar capacity of Detroit. Um, and, and again, this gets back to his personality as having a bit of an urban planner in him. Um, he was able to play out the politics pretty well in Dearborn and get what he wanted. Not so much with Detroit because the taxpayers caught on to the fact that they were the ones subsidizing the extension of the street line, uh, not him, even though he was the major benefactor. So it got voted down in a, in a referendum. Um, but he continued being interested in um, the, supporting the transit systems of Detroit once he realized that he could, uh, it could be profitable for him if he started producing buses. So he was interested in automobile-related transit systems. Yeah, that's right. He, he, I mean, he even got into airplanes and uh, oh, yes. a whole bunch of other things, too. Yes. Um, I was surprised to see um, that there was also a planned community in Muscle Shoals. I knew nothing about that. Uh, I see you nodding your head there, Matt. You know, what do you know about that? Yeah, no, Ford had got involved. Well, he was always fascinated with water power. You know, there's stories of him as a kid building water wheels outside the school and so forth. So he had a vision for building a 75-mile-long city, basically, along the Tennessee River in the Muscle Shoals area with a number of plants to uh, produce electricity and so forth. And the government wasn't too keen on that. A lot of that was federally owned land at, at the time, and it just was politically untenable that that land should be given to a private interest, even if Ford, in his own mind, had the best of intentions for it. But, I mean, did he go and build uh, neighborhoods or suburbs in, he, in Muscle Shoals? never got that far. The, the government simply would not sell him the land, didn't let it happen. So, ultimately, that becomes a part of the Tennessee Valley Authority project. Hmm. One thing to, to bear in mind always about Ford is that <clears throat> much of his his urban or rural development strategy was based on kind of vertical and horizontal integration of, of the Ford Motor Company. So he had model villages in the Upper Peninsula uh, you know, producing wood for, for use within the automobile. He created Fordlandia. Uh, uh, Explain that a little bit, because a lot of people don't know about Fordlandia. Well, he, he created this uh, this rubber plantation uh, model town in in the in the middle of uh, of Brazil, and he really was trying to again vertically and horizontally integrate by being able to to have his own rubber source rather than having to depend on others at a time when there was a lot of a uh, question about what was happening in the Pacific with, uh, with different uh, uh, imperial powers and everything else. But he created uh, this model village in the, in the middle of the Amazon, uh, which ultimately uh, failed because the fact that he didn't understand and his folks didn't understand at all what it actually meant to, uh, to have rubber trees. So he created and put them in rows in such a way that was not the way that rubber grows. And ultimately it, it failed as, as one of Henry Ford's uh, concepts. But I think it, it matches what Heather's really pointing out about the rise of Dearborn because it, it, it's a means to an end. It's not necessarily only urban planning or rural planning for its own use. It's because of the fact that it's matching the production system as well in terms of the needs for workers or the needs for raw materials and the rest. Mm -hmm. Fordlandia is a great story because it's Ford literally building an American Midwest style suburb in the middle of the uh, Amazon jungle there with these Cape Cod style houses, poorly ventilated. He's feeding indigenous workers hot dogs and hamburgers and things. Just totally didn't work for a number of reasons. Yeah. Did, did you see it that way too, Heather? That it was it. Uh, what caused Fordlandia to collapse, in your view? Well, so many things. I mean, some of it was just applying an assembly line uh, mindset to rubber trees, 
that are, they're not like workers who can be lined up in a row and function properly. It disrupted their entire ecosystem uh, to be planted that way. Uh, so many, many things did go wrong. But what I think is, is fascinating is that Henry Ford is this very eclectic genius. And he's interested in things like vertical integration, horizontal integration. He's interested in, he'll travel to the, the ends of the earth to build a rubber plantation. And I think um, I, he, he, that makes him so different from the rest of the leaders of the automobile industry. He's kind of this Renaissance man where there's no boundaries to his genius. He's going to build cars one day, and then he's going to create a rubber plantation the next day. And then meanwhile, he already has plans for model subdivision, so he's just going to pick up that plan, apply it to the Amazon. So he's this eclectic innovator. And I think what's so distinctive about him and what's so crucial to understanding about him is, to me, he embodies an American kind of genius, somebody like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. He's eclectic, he's eccentric, and, he, and, and geniuses are entitled to have a few failures. <laughs> so yes, the, the rubber <laughs> plantation did fail, but in the, if you put it in the scope of all of his successes, he is this very unique type of American genius. I'm not gonna say that made him a good person. I'm not gonna go that far. But I think we have to really respect that there was a time and a place where you could be this very eclectic type of genius and you could make it all, all these different interests intersect. And I think there was something uniquely American about that, about not feeling that you had to be contained in a, to be a certain, have a certain type of specialty. Yeah. Well, he believed that you could imagine a world and that you could bring it to pass. I mean, that you could actually move different things around the landscape in the, in the way of, uh, again, creating Dearborn or creating the, the Rouge plant or creating Fortlandia. He really imagined that out of his own mind, he could put a vast imprint on the landscape, uh, on, on the way that business ran. And Absolutely. He had a, like, a Midwestern mentality like the pioneers who believed in manifest destiny and were going to literally walk across prairies for hundreds of miles. I mean, it's, it's just a spirit of entrepreneurship that I kind of wish we could get back to. And yet he was a flawed genius in a way, oh, too, because, you, John, you're the professor of labor relations. I mean, they had some terrible labor relations on well, Henry Ford. And, and I think uh, that if, if uh, Ford imagined one thing, it was uh, imagining that workers uh, didn't need an outside party to actually give them what a benevolent boss should be able to deliver. And you, know, you, can't, you can't put Henry Ford forward without understanding that, that uh, Harry Bennett was standing in his shadow as head of the Service Bureau in relation to really um, you know, kind of a certain amount of thuggery to keep unions out. We're coming up on the, well, we just passed, in fact, the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Overpass when Walter Ruther and, and Dick Frankenstein were, um, were basically beaten by thugs from the Service Bureau when they were attempting to uh, uh, organize Ford in 1937. And that did not become successful for another four years afterwards. So uh, I think that the other flaw is um, we know that, that Ford was, for the most part, uh, anti-Semitic. And that, that he had kind of a, almost a, a naive racism in his own way. That is, he believed very strongly in uh, the kind of uplift of African Americans, but within bounds. And so that you weren't going to see job ladders uh, at Ford uh, really being combined in terms of white and black. You were going to have truly black jobs within the foundries and everything else. All the dirty, dangerous jobs. All the dirty, dangerous jobs, and that you were going to have white jobs that that in effect you would never put a, a black man into. And bringing it back to urban planning, so he did nothing to integrate Dearborn. And um, African-American Ford workers either lived in downtown Detroit and had this very difficult hardship with commuting into Dearborn, or they lived in their own suburb called Inkster, which I perhaps either one of you might be more familiar with and could, could speak to that. 
No, you're absolutely right. Uh, Dearborn was white only, and uh, with mayors that enforced that all the way up through the late 70s, in fact. So it, it wasn't anything all that new. What I'd like to turn the conversation to briefly as we're getting towards the end of the show, Matt, is that suburbs, uh, I think one of the premises of Heather's book is suburbs help lead to the decline of industrial cities as tax base and people went out. But we're starting to see a rejuvenation in the United States. You know, I, I think cities like Pittsburgh and even Cleveland to a degree, Indianapolis have come back and now we're starting to see it in Detroit. How do you explain that? You know, as, as a curator of a transportation museum, how do you explain yeah, that? Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, the millennial generation, they seem to be moving away from the suburbs and that model and wanting to move downtown. And because of that, we're wanting to see jobs return downtown and some of the amenities. Here in Detroit, the Motor City, we just had a streetcar open of all things. So it's amazing the kind of change that's taking place. We'll see how that bears out as the, you know, the young generation has children and, and ages. But uh, it certainly looks like the start of a big shift. Do you see? Uh, uh, sorry, the, other, John, the other shift that... Uh, Bear in mind now with, with uh, kind of uh, uh, web-based jobs, people can, can live anywhere. So they can easily live in a loft in Detroit and actually be working for a, a Silicon Valley firm or could be working for a New York-based multinational. So in, in that way, the, you're, you're disconnecting where you live from where you work in a, in a fundamental way that allows urbanization to come come back but with again within bounds you're never going to see Detroit back up to its its 1920 level okay it's just not that's simply not going to happen but you very well may see a, a mixture the other thing is the, 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 what it means to have a mono industry so Detroit was so auto centric that the minute that you you move a, a, a major centerpiece like auto out of the equation you have to have a lot of competing kind of sectors that are all rising simultaneously to take that large, you know, kind of mono uh, uh, industry uh, place. Otherwise, it, you, you, just can't, you, you just can't develop. Mm -hmm. Heather, how do you explain that, you know, if you go back 100 years ago plus, people wanted to get out of the city and they wanted their own home with a nice green grass yard with an elm tree with a swing and a porch and a picket fence and and now we're starting to see people gravitate back into it. What kind of societal change do you see going on or do you? Well, I guess I'm a little bit more split about that. Um, I see Detroit as a city as having endless untapped potential. I don't know if we have revitalized it yet. Um, when you hear about things like the state of the Detroit public schools and the conditions that school children have to live in, it's really heartbreaking. Um, and also, um, suburbs here are still thriving in the sense, regardless of whether people are telecommuting or you know, if they're moving into a loft in Detroit that they can pick up for a very small amount of money and become an investor. Um, I don't know if that demographic trend residentially can offset all of the wealth that is in the Detroit suburbs. Um, in wealth, not just financially, but wealth in terms of um, the intellectual capital, the specialties in research and development, uh, the physical location of where all the innovating and engineering is happening, a lot of that is in the suburbs. So there's an economic base in the Detroit suburbs that I just think well offsets what's happening with the economic base of Detroit. So I look at the suburban trend of, as being not just where people are living, but also where's the economy? The suburban economy is still thriving. Matt, why do you suppose it was Henry Ford that did this? Why not other automotive barons of industry? Well, Ford, for all of his success as a, a sort of captain of industry, always considered himself a farm boy at heart. You know, he never left the farm in spirit, hated the farm work, but loved the idea of it. So I think he was eager to kind of return his workers, bring them all along to this pastoral sense of, uh, of rural America. Why not somebody at General Motors or Chrysler or of any one of the many other car companies that existed at that time? One answer that very well may work in relation to General Motors is that Ford controlled his, his family industry, and so did his children, and so did his grandchildren moving forward. 
Whereas General Motors became kind of a, a faceless corporation to a, a great degree. And through the mergers of all the various pieces uh, that became General Motors, it, it didn't have that same kind of solitary genius that was really taking a family legacy forward. And so in that way, um, you know, we have a lot of family names on our various uh, uh, things like Dodge and, and other things, but they did not persist in exactly the same way that Henry Ford did. And I think that could be a big difference. Yeah, he really was a global figure, not just a, a, a national figure. And some of the others, the Dodges, the Chryslers and the like, didn't have the global recognition that he did. So. Look, this is very interesting. I, you know, I, I love being able to tell this kind of story that, of course, everybody knew the history of the Model T and Henry's involvement in it. I surely did not know how involved he was in developing suburbs as well. So Heather, thanks so much for writing this book, and especially thanks for coming into the show to talk all about it. Oh, thank you. And, and John and Matt, I want to thank the both of you two uh, for adding so much detail to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner.